welcome to Humanities on the Road. Today we're at the Dietrich Theater in Tunkhannock, Pennsylvania for Alive to the Call, Women and History in Northeastern Pennsylvania with Josephine Dunn. I'm Tracy Matisak, and you know, Humanities on the Road is really a collaboration. It's a joint project between the Pennsylvania Humanities Council and the Pennsylvania Cable Network, and the whole idea is to bring together people from all across the state to talk about the important ideas that shape our day, and we count you among those people so that we are delighted to have you with us. We want to extend special thanks to our host today, the Dietrich Theater, the Wyoming County Cultural Center. We are thrilled to be here. You know, if movies are indeed the great American art form, then nowhere is that more evident than here at the Dietrich Theater. Their fall and spring film festivals feature a whole range of films, uh, first run, foreign, independent, all kinds of movies. But you know, the Dietrich Theater is not just about movies. In fact, last year they had 345 programs here with more than 60,000 people in attendance. Uh, for instance, they salute the great Susquehanna River with Celebrate Our River Day and some fun hands-on nature activities for the kiddos. They've got live theater, they've got summer acting camps for kids, they've got multicultural dance classes. Their art studio has classes in pottery and painting and sculpture. There are health seminars on everything from yoga to drug awareness. And there are programs like Wyoming County Reads that opens up classic literature and brings it to life. So from folk art to film to nature, the whole mission of the Dietrich Theater is really to provide cultural programming for Wyoming County and beyond. And believe me, with the diversity of events here, there truly is something for everyone. Our speaker today is Dr. Josephine Dunn. She is a Commonwealth speaker with the Pennsylvania Humanities Council. She is a professor of art history at the University of Scranton with a degree, a PhD degree, from the University of Pennsylvania. She is the director of the art and music program and co-directs the Italian studies program at the U, as it's called if you grew up around these parts. She has been studying and researching the history of women in Northeastern Pennsylvania for over five years now. And four years ago, she founded the annual conference on women's history in this region. She has also written a guidebook for the Pennsylvania Commission on Women, and she has written two books on the topic that we'll be discussing today. Please join me as we give a warm welcome to Dr. Josephine Dunn. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon at the historic Dietrich Theater here in Tunkhannock in the poetic Endless Mountains north of Scranton in Wyoming County. Because Tunghannock and Scranton are geographical sisters, I'd like to focus this presentation not on the full spectrum of historic Northeastern Pennsylvania women that I usually discuss, but on women who made history closer to Tunghannock. I suspect that for every Scranton woman I introduce this afternoon, there is also a Wyoming County woman who remains unrecognized and therefore unknown in Pennsylvania history. Keep this thought in mind as we learn of little studied women, lost ladies, and forgotten initiatives of our regional women. I think this vintage postcard says it all. Although it enjoins its recipient not to forget the girl left behind in Scranton, Basically, that's exactly what we have done. We have forgotten them. But did we ever really know them? I wonder. Well, admittedly, we know much about the young women who worked in the silk mills, like these ladies from the Sequoit Mill in Scranton. There's also the story of women who worked at the Scranton Lace Company. But this remains a partial story because the records that could have told us so much about the company were carelessly thrown away. We know much about the lives and time of women married to minors like these. Their story is one of struggle to keep large families going while burying their menfolk along the way. We have a museum that commemorates anthracite mining heritage 
where the story of women is only just now being included. We also know much about the rich immigration history of the Lackawanna Valley, a history that continues to enrich Scranton's present. How many families today lived once like this one, new to America and hopeful for a better future in a town growing like wildfire in early 20th century Pennsylvania? In the end, we know something about women in the collective, factory and mill girls, miners' wives, immigrant mothers. But what do we know of individual women? In rare cases, something has survived of the lives of a few remarkable women, thanks to maverick research here and there. For instance, I'm grateful to the Wallen Popak Historical Society that reprinted a volume of poetry, Cobwebs, by Harriet Gertrude Watrous. Hence, it is still possible to read Harriet's poems of Civil War days and late 19th century life in Scranton. As you observe the sculpted relief from Scranton's Soldiers and Sailors Monument, hear Harriet's thoughts in this two-verse poem, Send Them Home Tenderly. Send them home tenderly, poor, breathless clay. Yet what brave hopefulness bore them away, hand to hand clingingly linked in sweet trust, tenderly, tenderly, bring home their dust. Teachers, if our children are not studying Harriet's poetry in their classroom, they should be. Not because Harriet was a woman, but because she was a rare, talented poet of Civil War days, writing of that time in our region. Harriet Gertrude Watrous is a voice that lives still. Thanks to the sisters, servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, who maintain a rich archive at Marywood University, we know much about this order of nuns and its founder, Sister Dushman. No order was more active in northeastern Pennsylvania than this one, and no order did more for the education of women either. Local women's history is embedded in the history of this teaching order. This history we know, thanks to the nuns themselves. And I'm happy to report that an historical marker now commemorates their contribution to women's education in the state. The marker, sadly enough, is only one of five that honor women in northeastern Pennsylvania. Ladies and gentlemen, we can do better than five for the women of our region. Thanks to scholars in Alaska, the life of intrepid Belinda Mulrooney of Carbondale is well known. The rag to riches story of this Irish girl who left home at the age of 16, struck it rich in the Klondike and built a castle for her home is the kind of story one imagines in film, yet it happened. It's also part of Lackawanna women's history, and a biography of this entrepreneurial businesswoman has been written called Staking Her Claim. The book is not sold in any of our local bookstores. What a shame. Only one woman of color is well known in Scranton history, Louise Tanner Brown. The Tanner family bequeathed to American history Louise's uncle, Bishop Benjamin, Benjamin Tanner, and her cousin, the celebrated artist, Henry Ossawa Tanner. But Scranton has Louise, educated, philanthropic, and much respected by blacks and whites in early 20th century Scranton. Her story as it is known is still incomplete. More remains to be found that will allow us to draw the portrait of women of color in Scranton. In northeastern Pennsylvania, research on the Underground Railroad is burgeoning, but the history of local African-American women is not. The ladies that I've just mentioned are to a certain extent known, but so many others have been lost to history. Take artist Sarah Farley, for example, a young woman 
who aspired to be an artist at a time when it was very difficult to obtain the education she needed to support herself as a practicing artist. But Sarah found a way. She studied at the Art Students League in New York City, moved to Scranton, and embarked upon an advertising career that included regular ad work in Scranton newspapers and for local book publishers, the Board of Trade Journal and Poli Theater. Not only did Sarah wield the brush, but she plied the pen, writing features in Poli Theater programs and publishing an important essay in the Board of Trade Journal on the City Beautiful Movement in Scranton. Yes, Scranton did have women artists, and we're beginning to discover others, like the Mrs. Hester Worthington and Caroline Darling, who knew this history of women artists existed in our region. Did you know that one of Alexander Graham Bell's brightest students was for all intents and purposes the first president of what we know today as the Scranton State School for the Deaf? Emma Garrett came to Scranton in 1884 and established the curriculum for oral instruction of the deaf and supervised construction of the Great Stone School that stands today off Washington Avenue. So proud was she of the work she had accomplished in Scranton that she displayed our school at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair in the Children's Pavilion. A progressive educator imbued with dedication and fervor, Emma was despondent over the difficulties she was facing in establishing oral instruction in Pennsylvania. At the Chicago World's Fair, she took her life by jumping from her hotel window. A tragic story, yes, but also a story of innovative education in 1880s Scranton. Some may remember Mary Brooks Picken, who came to Scranton in 1914. In the space of two years, wrote, in the space of two years, wrote 64 textbooks and in 1916 opened what became the largest school for women in the world. Mary founded and ran the Women's Institute of the International Correspondence Schools. She began with a very modest operation and within five years was obliged to enlarge her school to the impressive and elegant dimensions you see here. Mary Brooks Picken left Scranton in the 1930s and the Institute closed its doors in 1938. Her building, however, remains. You know it today as Scranton Preparatory School. Another educational institution founded by a woman presides on North Abington Road in Waverly. It's the Waverly Community House. It bears the name of Henry Beelan Jr., in whose memory it was founded. It was Henry's wife, Margareta, who envisioned a community house in Waverly. She brought city and rural populations together in a space that was simultaneously educational, cultural, and civic-minded. Education, especially of the young, was Margareta's passion, and she found a staunch collaborator in teacher Gertrude Corson. The kindergarten movement began in late 19th century Scranton, largely advanced by progressive women and teachers, and by 1920, when the community house was built, kindergartens were part of the state school system. In Miss Corson's kindergarten, sons and daughters of farmers learned alongside children of Scranton's wealthy entrepreneurs. It was an idealistic venture, almost 